Thank you for coming for the uh, UK launch of Sneakers, the book. Uh, Alex and I have been working on it for about two years. The idea being to uh, bring to life the stories of the creative forces who make all these you know, sneakers on the wall happen that we all kind of care about and, and live by. So we wanted to have you know, an object to match the, uh, the coolness of all the other objects you have. It's the compendium to your sneakers. Why, why make a book? Sneaker, uh, sneaker media is, is now so largely digital, right? And everything moves really fast online. There's sneaker news every, you know, two minutes. There's a drop release, you know, news of that every 20 minutes. There's a ton of Instagram accounts to follow. And it's all good. It's fun to look at all that stuff. I spend a ton of time every day, like, going down that wormhole. And it's actually how I met, you know, how we found some people in, in the book, like Daniel Bailey, who's back there, Pink Hat, Chapter 23. Uh, celebrity, but we thought, you know, the real thing to do now to add to this space was to do something, something permanent, right? I mean, like, how many shoes do you have in, in all your closets, right? And they, they're important to you because you can you can feel them, you live with them, you can touch them. And the book is is a reference in the same way. You can go to the book for information. You can go to the book for inspiration. You can go to the book to put you in a better mood. You can have it on your coffee table, and it also kind of adds adds value. You know, literature about sneakers. With social media being so prominent with everything that we do these days, do you think it's taken away an element of really feeling connected to the products? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I feel like um, I feel like the um, we're at a, a little bit of a of a crossroads. Like we, you know, if you look at um, Supreme every day, you see all these kids who are lined up to buy the same product. You know what I mean? And it's like if if you're gonna if you're gonna put it on social media, if you're gonna create hype around it. The, the, the consumer really needs to find a way to sort of like flip the thing and make it their own. I think that's like the, the, the like a, a, um, a, an issue of like vital importance. But I think I don't, I don't think that's on social media. I think that's on like you, the consumer, to, to sort of be focused on that. Yeah. What was the process of choosing what goes into the book like? It's a lot of arguing, arguing, and and, and late night texting and sort of twenty four hour around the clock combative uh, reasoning about trying to do a book about. 40 years of, of culture and I mean originally it was supposed to be a 270 page book it ended up being around 320 pages uh, and to add 50 pages to a book during the process isn't really a typical thing so we were convincing our publisher like we need more we need more we need more and what we wanted to do was we wanted to get the people from the history of the culture who are absolutely essential like you can't have this book without Bobito Garcia whose, whose own book is so essential to what everybody knows about sneakers and you can't have this book without a guy like DJ Clark Kent 
Uh, but then at the same time, you know, newer people you want to include too. So we wanted to have the whole the whole scope. Granted, there's other people who deserve to be in a book too, and that's the fun of a sequel. How would you guys compare? Like, obviously, everyone has their own idea of what the how we see the U.S. sneaker scene compared yeah. to us. Yeah. How do you guys see it compared to the U.K.? I mean, I think it's it seems to me, or sort of the the impression. I mean, like, we wanted to come here because, like, you know, like, Keanu was over here, Kish Cash is in the book, and he's just so great. Um, it, it feels like one big global thing now. You know what I mean? I think that's sort of the, the internet is, has really democratized things and, 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 and changed things. So it just felt like the continuation, sort of like one large kind of like global community. Um, in terms of like, you know, I think we, we probably, you guys probably get the same stuff here that we get, maybe like a couple days later. So I mean, I I think it's all, you know, like equal. I think it, it's it's on equal footing. I, I also feel like what, like in terms of like just style, like Thanks we were good question. we were at lunch today and we noticed like everybody here was like tight. You know what I mean? Like, you know, granted, it was like a lot of dudes in suits, but still, it was like you don't see that in New York so much. You know, like it was. Like everybody looks good, and the U.S. Yeah. still draws so much of all its fashion influence from yeah. from all over Europe. And every time a collection comes out, you hear about its references to Renaissance Italy or British tailoring or uh, Age of Enlightenment Paris or, or whatever. I mean, the U.S. is a short history. The references aren't aren't that deep. So I, I do think there's always a way that the U.S. does look up to London uh, and Paris and Rome and other places for, for style tips here. I mean, I, I know I do. I know it's really fun for me to come here and see like people, how they, you know, how they dress. It's, it's always good. It's always good. So I, th I think I have a lot of respect for what goes on here. <coughs> what was the first sneaker that got you into sneakers? Thank you very much. Ooh, for me, uh, Jordan 4 was the, was the, <coughs> yeah, that was the gateway drug for me. What about you? Um, probably the Jordan 5. My brother got it, you know, I don't. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. You know, there's a part when we were doing the book at the very beginning when I kind of said, I'm not going to do this thing where I'm reporting this book about sneakers and I start buying all the sneakers because my integrity as a journalist is going to be compromised because all I'm going to do is care about the stuff and not the story. And that just went away in like a week. The sneakers always went down. Uh, and that's what the intro to the book is, is actually about. And, and now, I mean, there's periods where it's like, oh, I'm not going to buy anything this week, and then I'm like, oops, bought something today, oops, bought something today again, bought something today again. I think the last time I bought something was three days ago, so I'm, I'm doing pretty good right now. I've been sober for three days. How do we, we uh, the order of the book? Yeah. It's a rabbit hole. One person, it's like on Instagram, when you flip through, and then you click on one, you know, you, 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 you click on one person's profile, and that person's liked the photo by somebody else, or that person's connected to somebody else, and then you, you, you sort of like get down that thing, and then you know you click on that second person, that person leads you to the third person. Right. It's sort of like that, but with the story. It's like a trail. So there's no there's no coincidences yeah. in, 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 in the book. Yeah. So what we did was after after all the reporting and after understanding who everybody was and really getting a good sense of, of identity and what their their soul essentially you know was in in the book, we laid out everything on the floor, laid out the whole book in the on the floor of our publisher in, in New York, and we started moving you know the pages around based on who belonged next to who. So if you look at the the sort of lead writing at the beginning of every chapter. It kind of it, it's kind of a trick in a way because that space is usually just like display copy where it just says this person is this person they come from here they do this but that part of the book actually tells the story about how everyone's linked how you know an artist relates to an innovator relates to a scientist relates back to a bunch of kids relates to somebody who's working with leather masks um, so it all kind of ties together like a big communal story and it has it does have a beginning a middle. And then it starts kind of right where we are in New York, and it kind of ends with a look at the future. What's the story behind the front cover? What's the idea behind it? That's a great question. What's inside? What do you think's inside? It's different for everybody. No, but I mean, like, what's like? Don't you just want to open it? Like, don't you want to know it's in there? I mean, that's the question. Is like, you know, it's like the. Uh, so the we the first cut the first draft of the cover was interesting. It was there was no there was no cover on the box, right? It was. 
it was like a flat look at the box, like sort of from the top down with tissue paper. And it was like it's up to it's sort of like up to you to, to open it up and like discover what's inside. Yeah, it's kind of so like a, it's kind of a prompt. It's literally inviting you to like open up the book, open up the box, see what's inside, and also to think about like what would be inside your one box if you just had one one box. We felt like we couldn't do an actual sneaker on the cover of the book because like how would you how would you even do that? How would you choose from thousands? And then there's a branding problem, right? If you put a Nike silhouette on the cover, Adidas is going to get mad, and Nike's yeah. going to get mad if you do the same thing reverse. Reverse people get mad. So we wanted to make it about imagination, but also really relatable and, uh, you know, with some good colors too. There was uh, an idea at one point to do the book in a couple of different colorways. So the one that ended up running is, is this, uh, you know, this red and orange version, but there was also a green and blue version that we were going to run out as a second cover. Uh, and that could still happen at some point. So who knows? Who knows? I'll take that as an exclusive. Yeah. I, I love the, there's just so many like underdog stories in the book, you know, like just people who had to, you know, like people who like grew up with nothing and, you know, like really loved shoes as kids and didn't, you know, couldn't, couldn't get shoes, you know, they're like, they're great immigrant stories. I don't like Yu Ming Wu, um, the guy who runs Sneaker Con, you know, his parents, he, he was born in China and lived in China and his parents brought him to the United States and his parents worked in sweatshops, he worked in sweatshops, and then his parents saved up enough money to buy a Chinese restaurant, and he sort of learned how to grind by watching his parents. And so, I mean, and now he's, he like buys his dad Yeezys. There's like, a great photo in the book. Yeah, there's a great photo. Wearing, yeah. wearing the Yeezys. Um, the guys who run Extra butter, butter in New York is another sort of amazing immigrant story. You know, this family moves to the United States, and you know, um, Ankar's dad worked at a shoe store, and he saved up enough money to actually buy that shoe store from the guy that he was working for. And then they, you know, they, they rallied that and, you know, they made a chain and now they're doing just like the most unlikely collaborations with people like this, this week they had uh, the cloud come out with Ghost Space Killer. That's, we saw it the other day, it's awesome. Yeah, it's like, it's like deep, like Merlot, Saucony with like a, uh, and it's all based on these leather jackets that Ghostface would buy on the Lower East Side yeah. of New York with like high zip collars and, and so the shoe has its own kind of zip up collar, like a cuff around. Same way, you, it, it almost turtlenecks up, up the ankle and it's this beautiful burgundy leather. But I think for us the story is like when we would call each other at the end of the day and kind of have a daily meeting about what we reported and, and who we talked to, the conversations were always about, you know, these emotional things and how grateful we felt to be able to tell stories about um, you know, real people who worked really hard to get where they are. There's no one in in this book who kind of wrote in with a silver spoon on, on their mouth in, in their mouth. It's all stories of of incredible hard work, and it's a privilege to be able to, to really tell those stories. You know, people who through through creativity and just grinding it out rose up to make great things that really just influence culture. We have a guy in the book named Gary Lockwood who makes who is a sort of a wayward art student about five years ago, didn't know what he was gonna do. He spent all this money on graduate, you know, graduate art school in, in, in DC and had moved to LA and was like walking dogs. And then one day he was like in a store and he was like, I, I need to be making art every single day. And so he started making masks out of, purse, out of purses. And he was like, you know, because he, he chose purses because it was kind of like what he could afford or what he could find. And he was like, you know what? I kind of don't care about purses. Like I kind of care about sneakers. So he started going to the Nike outlet. You know, and he, and he was buying uh, dunks and ripping them apart and making gas masks out of them. And then, you know, like, and then, he, you know, he sold one and so he, he made another one and he sold that. And now he's, I was talking to him one day when he was, when he was um, melting the glue on a pair of mags to make a, uh, to make a, 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 a great white shark out of, out of it. Because in uh, Back to the Future 3, there's a scene where the great white shark comes out of the billboard and takes a, you know, like, tries to bite Michael J. Fox. He was making like incredible art out of like super rare sneakers. You know, it's like he he used this thing that he loves to sort of like dig himself out of a hole. Like th those stories were sort of the most rewarding for me. Yeah. So um, there's been a rise of street uh, popularity of streetwear brands. Yeah. So uh, recently, I think it was the list recently announced that Off White is the third most popular brand, like desired brand. Why is um, a brand like Off White in the streetwear culture? Why is it more desirable than stuff like Gucci and Versace? Why do you think that is? I think Off-White's getting, I mean, I, I work for, um, 
a lifestyle and fashion magazine also, and so, so does Alex. And I think in, in those editorial conversations, there isn't too much of a gap now between talking about a brand like Gucci and talking about somebody like Virgil. I mean, he's really just captured people's imaginations and captured their attention. And I think the reason the, the reason he's done it, the product is really cool, the shoes are all really beautiful, he's actually just really smart. He's, he's often, I think, the smartest guy in, in the room. Here's someone who's you know, a trained architect, great academic background, understands theory. Uh, he gave a talk at the Columbia University School of Architecture a few years ago. It's on YouTube, and I remember watching it right before I interviewed him for this piece and you know this this guy could be one of the best architecture professors in the country if he wanted to and he just has this kind of big brain so I think when you're talking about someone like him it doesn't matter if he's designing streetwear or couture and he, he actually just does both I think what he wants to be is kind of like a generational talent like a LeBron type where it's just like holy shit like he had his own era I, I so so two points I think what he's doing really well is the message of off-white, like those two words, off-white, are really simple, right? It's just like really simple, super clean branding. I think the other thing that we're seeing a lot, especially in the United States, if you, there's a store called Concepts, Concepts International. They have a store in Dubai, they have a store in Boston, they have a store in New York. Um, and they're actually putting like Louis, Vitt Louis Vuitton and um, Versace and Balenciaga on their shelves next to like Van Slip-Ons. The new yeah. Kith store has that too. So yeah. it's, it's like all the all Dude, the Kith stuff, and then on the third floor, it's like we're uh, seeing a lot, like a vintage Chanel purses. Yeah. So I think there's like a nice mix, high and low. You know, those things sort of mesh well. I also think people who are kind of emerging in in the streetwear world now know that if they grow their brand successfully, they're not just limited to the streetwear box. It can be who can be a global brand right now. Like that's that's the challenge. Who can who can grow. And I don't think that many people want to be identified as just one thing anymore. I think it's the ability to like say, I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this. So, uh, you know, there's a deeper question in your question, and it's what is streetwear?